to. All right, so continuing on uh, with uh, our conversation with Dr. Tyler Perry, author of Jumping the Broom uh, with UNC Press, which you should definitely consider, um, if not cite. <laughs> uh, I wanted to ask this question because um, you, the last uh, conversation, you really set this up. So I, I wanted to actually spend some time on it. Uh, and that was, would you see the modern arguments of legitimate history of jumping the broom as a battle over a public memory of issues of race, marriage, and even identity? Yeah, so I mean, the short answer is yes, but there's a significant <laughs> amount of nuance within it. And I think the best way to approach this question for me is to talk a little bit about how I approach writing in mm -hmm. general. Yes. Um, one of the things that goes into my thought process before I write most anything is, would I have enjoyed this before I became a scholar? Mm. Right? Would I have read something like this as a person who is not deeply invested in the historiography, may or may not have heard of this particular topic? Is it accessible to a person like I used to be before I went into the profession of, of history? Right. And so this whole idea of what is or is not legitimate, I think is at the heart of what, how most people are interested mm -hmm. in this particular topic. Because as you noted, I did kind of set this up in the, the last segment in that one thing that becomes pretty clear when you're looking at the historical record and like these massive gaps to some degree that kind of permeates uh, the long trajectory of jumping the broom, particularly in American life, is by the time Alex Haley is writing Roots, yes. one thing that maybe he is not given enough credit for in this entire conversation is that he was interacting with a lot of different scholars behind the scenes. And whether he did or did not do all of his own research, he certainly had a research assistant that would report to him as, as kind of the archetypes convey, is you know, he he did know a lot about slave culture. Yes. Um, Lerone Bennett Jr. was a friend of his, uh, you know, who wrote before the Mayflower, was the senior editor of Ebony Magazine. And certainly Haley is being influenced by all of these different pop cultural phenomenons of where there is a resurgence of, you know, what I guess you could say a resurgence of what it means to have black pride and how people articulate that in the context of the 1960s, but particularly in the post-civil rights era of the 1970s and then in the 1980s. And so Roots comes within this period where Haley is simultaneously celebrating all aspects of the survival skills of his ancestors, be they literal or symbolic, but he's also intervening in questioning what was or was not desirable for a particular enslaved community at a particular time. Right. And this is where we get into this public memory aspect, because the vast majority of people, even to this day, have likely seen the miniseries Roots when it first came out, rather than actually having uh, read the book, mm -hmm. which is understandable because the book is not short. It's not. <laughs> It's well written, it's entertaining, yes. it's interesting, and it's a great piece of literary fiction, or you could call it historical fiction. But, um, you know, most people don't have the time to invest a lot of, of energy into reading a large book when a significantly large miniseries is available that more or less gives you all of the sections of the book in, in a pretty good visual display. However, one thing that I found uh, when I would look at subsequent interpretations of roots and the supposed African origins of jumping the broom is that they would always cite the wedding of Kunta Kinte and yes. Bell, yes. but the wedding that they would cite was the one featured on the miniseries, mm -hmm. which is subtly different in very important ways from the right. way Haley writes about it in the book. Yeah. Because, and I go over this in, in the book, so I'm not revealing any anything <laughs> big here unless, unless you haven't read it yet. But one thing that I do, I do note that was very important is that there are moments where Kunta Kinte is questioning the value of jumping the broom mm. because 
And this is where I think Haley's knowledge is important to appreciate because Haley himself seems to have believed correctly that jumping the broom was not an African ritual, did not come from Western Africa as far as he understood it. And so if Kunta Kinte is a person who is interested in preserving his West African cultural heritage, then it makes sense that he would question a ritual associated with American slaves. And so, you know, Haley makes these subtle hints here where Kunta Kinte has questions saying, you know, this seems like a ridiculous thing to do for a marriage. Back in my homeland of Jufre village in the Gambia, we got married in this way and in this particular way. And it actually makes him deeply sad because he's thinking of the way he gets married within uh, Western Africa. So for the actual novel of Roots, at least at this initial point, jumping the broom is not the celebratory occasion for everybody. It's not depicted as something that is wholly good, though it does suggest that for his wife, Belle, who was born in slavery in the United States, it was deeply meaningful for her. Mm. So there's, it's interesting to note how the miniseries at that point is going to set the tone for how subsequent generations are going to view the ritual. And, you know, I don't know if we'll get to this, so I'll mention it now. In the conclusion of the book, I actually look at the new rendition of Roots right. and notice how significantly it departs from the original miniseries and actually pays a more correct homage to how Haley actually seems to envisioned it when he was writing the novel of Roots because the Kunta Kinte in the revised version of the miniseries actually mirrors Kunta Kinte's thoughts within the original novel. But for what we're talking about here in the context of the mid 1970s yes. into the early 1980s, what Roots and Ebony Magazine in general are doing is they are setting a standard for integrating different cultural rituals into what we now call heritage weddings. Right. Now, all of this aligns with the rising importance of what is called by many scholars the wedding industrial complex, right. a billion built upon billions of dollars yes. industry yeah. in which the middle class, be they black or white, are willing to pay exorbitant amounts of money simply for a single day in which they're celebrating the, the, the occasion. Right. Now you have the standard white wedding so-called, which is typically associated with the white wedding dress, a large display, wedding attendants, uh, ring bearers, formalized process of having a wedding planner that gets you a venue and all of these other things. But for African-Americans, there was still a need to depart from the standard kind of white Christian tradition mm -hmm. by also integrating other aspects of cultural items that they associated with their own heritage. Now, sometimes those cultural items reflected an idea of Western Africa. Um, at this point, kente cloth was particularly popular and prominent. So you would see different items draped in kente cloth. Sometimes the dinners that were served at these heritage weddings either had what you might call a Southern fare, something along the lines of soul food, or it would be a section of Western Africa that had a particular type of either national or ethnic cuisine attached to it. Yeah. But you also start to see the implementation of jumping the broom. And for many people who are using the Roots miniseries as the barometer of how they understand the ritual, they're associating it with an African tradition because Kunta Kinte himself was embracing it within the right, visual right, display. Right. And then because a number of people, I think just simply didn't know about a lot of the sources that I will eventually use for this book. Um, and they didn't really fully understand the way, the complex ways which enslaved people discussed this particular ritual. They were starting to imagine methods under which this ritual could be carried over to the Americas. Because another thing that was occurring in the 1970s and the 1980s was really this kind of revolution in the way people were studying slavery in general. So historians themselves were starting to question uh, this idea that enslaved people were cultureless, docile laborers who um, had no significant culture that was worth explaining. So individuals like Blassingame, who I mentioned in an earlier segment, were starting to wonder what was the presence of Africa 
within right. the enslaved communities of North America, but what was also the presence of European traditions that enslaved people appropriated and acquired for themselves and really made their own. And of course, jumping the broom fits into this, but it wasn't yet fully appreciated as being that aspect of it, because I think for a number of people in particularly the 80s and the 90s, when Afrocentrism is becoming a significant factor for really self-conception at that point, um, if a ritual didn't come from an African tradition, it kind of delegitimized it for a certain segment of, of Black Americans who subscribe to Afrocentrism. Yeah. So if you were going to integrate jumping the broom into this wedding ceremonial process, you wanted to envision it as being part of an African cultural heritage and not something just associated with enslavement. Because if it's a slave ritual that was introduced by white slave owners, then that was it was perceived as less empowering of a ritual. Mm. But this was before I think the general population was really talking about agency and kind of right. the academic language that we employ and the ways under which people can acquire cultural traditions on their own terms. Right. So I don't think that was being fully appreciated yet, despite the fact that one could argue that that is kind of what Haley did with Roots. He was talking about multiple generations of people who were surviving the system in those particular ways. So, um, all of this to say about this idea of public memory is that that notion, particularly acquired from the 90s, is still very influential decades later. And it kind of makes sense because really the only works that seriously investigated Jumping the Broom were by individuals who had a deep investment for it remaining a piece of African-American weddings. So really the most popular text is Harriet Cole's Jumping the Broom, an African-American wedding planner, which sees uh, multiple reprints throughout the 1990s and then is re-released in 2002 and still in many ways remains this, the seminal text for how a number of Black couples who are trying to make a more African or African-American centered um, ceremonial process, they, they typically access that book to this day. Right. Um, one thing that Cole did, though, is that, you know, she wasn't a trained historian. She was a very good writer. She wrote for a number of magazines, and she just kind of made a, a few suggestions for the possible routes that Jumpy the Groom took, um, possibly suggesting it came from Western Africa. And here's what I think is kind of interesting about this entire uh, process that even I didn't fully appreciate until I returned to the text a couple of years ago before the book was published, in that many people cite Cole's work as this moment where she makes this claim that jumping the broom comes from West Africa. And they cite like Ghana and things right, like right. that. Or they, she says something about an ethnic group in Southern Africa that uses broomsticks or something to that degree. But she never actually makes an assertive point that it does come from Western Africa. She actually doesn't make that claim. Okay. But other people will do so on her behalf later. Okay. And so actually, if you even look at different blog posts on the internet today, it becomes even more interesting because of the trajectory and the path that it's taken. So where now people are claiming it has a specific origin point amongst the Asante Empire in Ghana, mm -hmm. despite the fact that there is no, there is no documented evidence that it was ever practiced in that in that area, but they are taking pieces of what they're assuming somebody said and just continuously building upon it. Right. Um, despite the fact that there's very little evidence for the claim. And so we can kind of see an actual documented history of how public memory is being shaped and reshaped and reimagined to fit the needs of a particular uh, frame of reference to where it is viewed that the only empowering aspect of Black culture in the United States must come from Africa and slave traditions as introduced by Europeans uh, must be rejected. Um, and you know, this is actually a disagreement that Cole gets into with different Afrocentric scholars, despite the fact that Cole's work is in many ways Afrocentric in kind of this general sense in which she is very much trying to root this 
understanding of Black American marriage within African cultural traditions. Right. But because she dared include a ritual associated with slavery within this broader framework, mm -hmm. um, a number of Afrocentric scholars, when they were interviewed and asked about this revival of the broomstick wedding within Black American consciousness, they actually said some kind of offensive statements about it in that, you know, when they would say, well, why not just use a spoon or a frying pan? Why, you know, you're using a broom already. Why not use that? Which actually was what motivated me to actually investigate, you know, what does the broom mean in the early 19th right. century? Right. And so without that historical context, you see a lot of very um, generalized assumptions mm -hmm. being portrayed on behalf of both professional scholars as well as the general public. And so this is where I found maybe the most important piece of my work for me personally, because I could have written a book that just went up to 1865, right. maybe talked a little bit about the reconstruction period, a little bit about the inception right. of Jim Crow. But I decided that what I thought people would really want to read was one in which I'm providing a chronological narrative from what I could see as the beginning all the way up to the present, right. because all of this is connected, that the history doesn't end simply because yes. people stop doing it at a particular yes. time. Like it <laughs> exactly. remains a, a valuable aspect right. of the way people are viewing themselves and their new circumstances right. and the ways in which the historical process continues to move. And so this is where I actually think that the book is particularly valuable for being assigned in classrooms, because the other, the other way that I write, to get back to my original statement early on, is I want to write books that I think I could assign in my own classes. Right. And this is one of the reasons I got into blogging and all of these other things, because there are certain topics that I, I wanted to make accessible to undergraduate students, um, as well as non-specialists, that they can feel comfortable reading this book and find value in it for their own um, circumstances, as well as it being interesting to scholars as well. So one of the reasons I engaged in this entire process of public memory is, I guess, maybe I should just say very clearly, though this is made in the acknowledgments, I myself jumped the broom when I got married, which right. really was a foundational moment of thinking right. about this project. Right. And um, But also, I know that a number of other people were probably asking very similar questions, but the information just simply wasn't there. Right. And so the book is simultaneously kind of a narrative history. It has a text that I think that I hope is engaging for people, but it also provides some guidelines for you know, the ways that people can think about the historical process mm -hmm. and the way that it continues to inform even these present debates and disagreements that people are still having over the viability of the right. broomstick wedding as a cultural tradition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you bring up a lot of points. I think uh, this is forcing me to want to go back and reread Roots, uh, but also do that kind of comparison of the, you know, the, the classic version versus the more modern version. Uh, I think it's also important to recognize um, for the for the audience is that you know one of the things that you're driving home is that we need to look at sources like ebony, you know, jet, um, you know, these popular cultures as uh, you know popular forms of uh, print, um, and even today, you know, you talked about blogging and social media, which I also wanted to to highlight is to ways to understand history that they influence historical interpretation. Um, as you were talking, one thing that popped into my head that I honestly had not considered before is you know, you're making these clear demands about the politics of memory without question. And, you know, there's conversations, Adam Dombey's written about the false cause, you know, and many others have written about Barbara Gannon has the one cause. And, and I think in some ways you're, you could make an argument, maybe this isn't the right term for it, but like the marriage cause, right? Mm -hmm. Like that you're, you're, you're showing through like the, the evolution Right, the way it resurges back in modern history as this way in which they're making connections to a to a longer past and to not be forgotten. Um, so that just to me was really it's it's fascinating and and I think is really important. So I thank you for forcing me to reconsider the politics of marriage and memory, right, and and tradition. Because as you said, I jumped the broom, and that was something I it's going to sound I put my foot down on. Like this is what I want to do is when. For me, that was the one thing I wanted with the marriage ceremony. I wanted to jump through because I, uh, it meant 
having had uh, relatives who were enslaved, I wanted to have some type of connection. So knowing that this book was coming out, my first question is, uh oh, I hope uh, like <laughs> I, I need to know to make sure that was I right in that decision or and it, it was a personal understanding that I thought was important for the process, for the history of the, the act. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. And to keep this kind of final point brief is that one thing that did occur when I was in the process of writing this book early on, and, you know, I was reading all this material about how the, as far as we could tell, the first practitioners lived in the British Isles or Western Europe, broadly conceived. They were all from these marginalized, underrepresented backgrounds, rural, peripheral cultures to some degree from the larger body politic. And then it's carried over in a variety of different ways and acquired by enslaved people. I had so many conversations of just people being so disappointed within that revelation that this was not an African tradition. Right. That was very meaningful to people. Right. And so that actually really informed the way that I approached writing the book, particularly in the conclusion, because the point that I want to make, and I've even had people ask me this, they're like, so are you saying that Black people shouldn't jump the broom? I said, no, that's not at all what I'm saying. I'm saying that this is a decision that people have made throughout history, mm -hmm. and a similar decision is still being made by mm -hmm. people who yes. choose to, to use it or not to use it. Right. Um, because I think it's valid to say you don't want to do it. Um, if it's not for you, that's that's a personal choice, even after you've read the history. But what I, all I want is that for people to be informed about the history and to not just kind of generalize the experience in that this is a very diverse um, cultural practice, yes. not just, you know, across cultures, but internally as well. There is right. no single way to do it. And that we have, if we're truly going to make a judgment or an assessment upon the decisions that people in the past are making, we have to read the words that they talked about, the, the ways under which they understood themselves and the decisions they, that they were making on behalf of themselves and each other. Oh, I mean, that's very powerful. And uh, thank you for that point. 